Okay. When a man in the material in the material world takes more interest in the materialistic way of life rather than Krishna consciousness, he is considered to be in a diseased condition. Prabhupada writes. Huh? So that's the key point. We can understand to what degree we're becoming healthy or diseased by to the, by the degree to which we're becoming more interested in Krishna and the degree to which we're becoming disinterested in the material energy. Hmm? It's one way that we can see. Are we becoming more spiritually healthy or are we becoming more spiritually diseased? More materially, sorry, diseased. Hmm? Okay, so the maya is the thing that makes us forget Krishna. Hmm? And Prabhupada writes here that when we put faith in maya, we become a candidate for hope against hope. Isn't that interesting? Because the material energy itself, see, faith means what? The term shraddha, shraddha, right? One of the translations of it is the place where the heart finds shelter. Hmm? The place where the heart finds shelter. But the material energy itself doesn't give any shelter. Hmm? Prabhupada explains that if you give up the eternal for the temporary, you lose both. Hmm? If you give up the eternal for the temporary, you lose both. Why? The eternal is fully present, but you've let go of that. You're holding on to something which is temporary, but the fact that it's temporary means that you can't hold on to it for very long. It's going to leave you. Huh? So one who gives up the eternal for the temporary loses in all respects. So the faith in the material world means that the individual is trying to hold on to the temporary. And because in modern society we don't even know how to deal with the material energy properly, it's not like previous times where people lived in a more sattvic lifestyle. It's even more lethal. Hmm? These Western societies or this world view, which is in intense mode of passion, intense mode of ignorance, is even more lethal, more dangerous. Huh? So our job is to get out. Prabhupada says you want to raise the alarm. You get out and you raise the alarm to also get as many other individuals out as soon as possible. So every day is a day to cultivate our Krishna consciousness. Huh? Let's see. Prabhupada makes a point that this world is, is... People are following, misled by these blind leaders. And Prabhupada talks about that. He mentions politicians, philosophers and scientists. And he explains why they're blind. He says they're blind leaders because they are not Krishna conscious. This relates to what we were speaking about also. Being able to understand what the actual root cause of this material energy is. It is Krishna. Krishna, aham savasya pravavo, mata savam pravatate, iti matva vajante mam, buddha bhava samamvata. Everything is emanating from one person. But there's more to it. He says the wise who understand this, what do they do? They engage in my devotional service, Krishna says. Isn't that interesting? So if people actually understand what's going on, there's a symptom that they understand. Because actually, all of the material problems can only be solved ultimately by spiritual solutions. Huh? Even certain materialists have understood this. Einstein said that one cannot solve a problem in the same consciousness or mentality that got them into the problem in the first place. Isn't that interesting? So we're in this difficulty because we have a materialistic mentality. And what the materialists try and do is they try to so-called solve the problems by adding more of the same materialistic mentality that got them into trouble in the first place. So modern society has to ask itself a question at a certain point. Right? How do you solve these issues? What do you want to do? Are you simply, are you going to deal with the cause or simply keep trying to adjust the effect? All of these issues in the world, these are effects 
of an underlying materialistic worldview and the lack of Krishna consciousness. It's so real. Prabhupada was in America in 1976. I can't remember if it was Chicago or San Francisco. At that time, whichever state he was in was the slaughterhouse capital of America. And the weather was bitterly cold. Prabhupada told the devotees, if you can get them to close down these slaughterhouses, immediately the weather will change. Hmm? Immediately the weather will change. In Bhagavatam, in the pastime of, uh, let's see, which king? Prithu Maharaj. Prabhupada explains that when there is a righteous situation, Mother Earth, Mother Nature actually gives resources. Hmm? But where people are sinful, then actually the resources are restricted. Hmm? So people think that there is your, you know, your realistic person who's getting to grips with society and sorting problems out, and then you have your sentimental religious people who are, who are just out of touch with what's going on. No. Actually, the people who are truly God conscious, they are making the greatest contribution to, to this society, to this world that can be made. Because the root cause is actually spiritual. So when devotees perform their yagya, when this Harinam Sankirtan yagya is performed, by sacrifice everything is provided. So even the materialist gain by the propagation of this International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Isn't that amazing? Everyone gains when the devotees perform Sankirtan Yajna. Hmm? And without that Yajna, everything, everything goes down. And we see that in the material world now. Because of more and more materialism, everything goes down. Huh? So chanting is the ultimate solution. Um, Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalo, Nastyeva, 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 Gatiya, Nyata. Huh? So it's explained that when something is stated three times like that in the Shastra, it is a categorical. Hmm? There is no other way, there's no other way, there's no other way. The realization, self-realization, attainment of full God consciousness can only be achieved by the chanting of the holy names in this particular age. Hmm? Because we don't have the qualification of the previous ages to perform the different activities which were done previously to become self-realized. Hmm? So what is Kali Yuga? In Kali Yuga everything decreases. People's intelligence, lifespan, you know, qualifications, all of these things go down. There's one thing that increases in Kali Yuga, that is the false ego. Isn't that amazing? Everything goes down except the Ahankara. That goes up. Yeah. So, we want to really take this on board. <clears throat> Again, potent and powerful instructions from Srila Rupa Goswami, elaborated by His Divine Grace Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. They know what it takes to go back they're from that platform. And interestingly enough, even more than that, what we're trying to do as devotees in, is enlist under Kripa Siddha. We're trying to get the mercy of these pure devotees and they will petition the Lord on the behalf of the devotee and by their own intimate connection, we get so much more than we are qualified to receive. Hmm? So that's, it's, it's a great blessing. It's not just the teachings, but it's the teachings as is given by intimate associates of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because everything in Krishna consciousness is very sweet and very personal. We should want to perfect ourselves so we can really understand and see things for what they are. As is explained here, everything about Krishna is sweet like sugar candy. Huh? But we don't necessarily we don't necessarily see that or experience that immediately. Yeah? So Prabhupada explains that there are ten offenses to the holy name, there are three stages to chanting. He explains that by being free of the ten offenses, by avoiding the ten offenses on the Nama Parad stage, we can get a glimpse of the next stage. We come up. That means that the chanting of the holy names of Krishna is a lifestyle. 
It's not just an activity, it's a lifestyle. Because by not criticizing devotees, you can have better access to the holy name. By not blaspheming the Vedic literatures, literatures in pursuance of the Vedic version, one can access the holy name. By not being inattentive while chanting, one can access the holy name. So all of these are different lifestyle, different lifestyle aspects that allow someone to actually come into deep contact, pure contact with the holy name. <coughs> Harinan Chintamani, by Shri Bhakti Notako, says that even if one chants a syllable, right, a syllable of the holy name, one gets benefit. Huh? Of course, if one chants the full Maha Mantra, the benefit is far greater. But even a syllable, even a materialistic person, you know, who just, you know, the, the child who calls out to their Ma, right? Ma. M A. A part of the, of the name Rama. That child gets some benefit. Right? Because the holy names are so uh, extensively compassionate. But there's a science to that chanting. In terms of focus, for example, it is explained that the ability to focus is a function of the intelligence. Isn't that interesting? Uh, there's, a, there's a class that was given by His Holiness Giriraj Maharaj. He explained like that. The ability to focus is a function of the intelligence. Uh, so when we strengthen our intelligence through discussions of Upadesh Amrita and spiritual knowledge, one strengthens one's intelligence, one strengthens one's ability to focus. At the same time, it is also the case that when the mind becomes clean, Chaito Dapa Namajanam, when the mind becomes cleansed, uh, then that purified mind is easier to focus also. Uh, so we want to do everything that we can to come closer to Krishna. And that means in this age we want to do everything that we can to destroy the avidya, the ignorance, and come closer to the holy names. Uh, there are these three things. There's avidya, there's aparavidya, and paravidya. Avidya means nescience. Aparavidya means the scriptural knowledge about how the material energy works. And the paravidya is the scriptural knowledge, the supreme knowledge about one's relationship with Krishna and how to engage in the devotional service of the Lord. Hmm? What counts as knowledge in the material world is actually simply a vidya. And therefore, materialistic solutions often create problems. The strategies of materially minded people, see, honestly, they actually create more issues. Huh? Prabhupada, he explains like this in, in this particular place. Let's see what he says. Yes. He says, when, p when materialistic people engage in materialistic activities, when it doesn't work by material pursuits, he says they replace one mistake with another. Hmm? So actually, when, you, when someone is in ignorance, it's very dangerous. It's like you have a child. Your child is ill. Your child is seriously ill. So you rush your child to the hospital. And the doctor who meets you at the hospital, they look at your child and they say, don't worry, we're going to perform an operation on your child. So they start to operate on your child. And when they start the operation, they say, actually, by the way, just, uh, just to help you to feel peaceful and to have faith, I want to point out to you that I've never done this before in my life. And um, I don't really know how to perform the operation either. I've never been trained. I don't know anything about medicine. But it's okay. Because, you know, it'll be okay. Yeah? That's materialistic pursuits. Sorry? Yeah, well-intentioned ignorance. Yeah. Well-intentioned ignorance. So that's what's going on because they don't know. Prabhupada is a very powerful statement about materialistic leaders. This is very, very interesting. He says, when such atheists become leaders of society, the entire atmosphere is surcharged with nescience. Isn't that interesting? Because what leaders do, others follow. 
So when the leader himself or herself is blind, they actually put, they amplify their nescience into the, into the material atmosphere. Huh? So in one sense, we don't really have leaders in this modern world. We simply have misleaders. Hmm? And Prabhupada would often say it's like the blind leading the blind. So you have one blind person who's walking off a cliff, enthusiastically walking off a cliff, and boasting about how wonderful his direction is and encouraging everyone else to come with him to walk off the same cliff. It's very, very serious. But the opposite is also true. When you have spiritually powerful people, when you have spiritually realized personalities, their presence and their teachings and their guidance it's extremely auspicious. Why? Think about this. Following on this analogy of a blind person, you see, you can get the benefit of another person's consciousness. Right? So you have a person who's blind. That's not such a critical factor if the blind person is prepared to follow the instructions of someone who can see. Right? Individual A is blind. But they do not act according to their blindness. They're acting according to the directions of individual B who can see perfectly what's meant to be done. That is how a blind person can get the full benefit of someone else's perception. That's extremely powerful. That means that a pure devotee, his very instruction can actually overcome the disqualifications of other people on the one condition that those people will follow what he says. Huh? Isn't that interesting? You can get the benefit of someone else's consciousness through following their instruction. Hmm? Otherwise, your destiny is based upon your own mentality. Hmm? And let's look at it honestly. Do you want the destiny based upon your mentality or do you want the destiny of Srila Prabhupada's mentality? Do you want the destiny of Sri Rupa Goswami's mentality? Huh? What their consciousness is aligned to, that's what you get by following their instructions. Hence we have Upadeshamrita. Huh? The nectar of instruction. Huh? Interesting. Because if you follow their instruction, you will taste the nectar. Let's move on to see a few other points. Prabhupada says, this Krishna consciousness movement is to create an atmosphere where people can chant. Huh? He says, it, one has to begin with faith, and when that faith is increased by chanting, then one comes to Krishna consciousness. Huh? There's a quote, which I feel is really interesting. Prabhupada says, we are sending Sankirtan parties all over the world, and they are experiencing that even in the remotest part of the world, where there is no knowledge of Krishna, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra attracts thousands of men to our camp. Hmm? Sometimes people wonder, okay, if Krishna is fair, why is it that some people are born in a situation where they don't hear about Krishna? Hmm? So there's an answer to that. Krishna explains to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita that from him comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. Hmm? If an individual wants to forget Krishna, if they want to be away from Krishna, he can also facilitate for that individual to take birth in a place in the world where they will not have to hear about him. Hmm? Of course, what he doesn't tell them is that his devotees have free will. And his devotees can freely go to people who have taken birth somewhere where they don't want to hear about Krishna and remind them about Krishna. Because they've got free will. Right? So that's a small print. You know, okay, you didn't want to know about me, so you took birth there. But guess what? By the way, my devotee wanted you to know about me, so he came and found you anyway. Right? Hence, you have the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. This is also why there are different religions. 
Because if someone wants to know God 50%, Krishna in the heart understands that he will allow them by facilitating them with a religion that will give them that degree of understanding of God. Someone wants to know Krishna 80-90%, he'll facilitate it in that way. They'll come to some process which will give them that level of understanding of God. And if someone wants to know Krishna in full, if someone wants to experience, as Rupa Goswami said, this transcendentally sweet nature, Madhuram, huh? Krishna is sweet, everything about him is sweet, then one has to be ready to give themselves in full, and thus they come to Krishna consciousness. Hmm? Therefore, Krishna consciousness in one sense is not a religion. Is the term that's used is theomorphic. It means it's the eternal nature of the soul. Huh? Or snatana dharma. The eternal function of the soul. Huh? And our culture is the culture of the spiritual world. It's not that you try something religious here, then you go back to God and do something different. No. What we're, pra what we're practicing here, what we're preparing for here, is the eternal culture of love and romance, the eternal culture of love and reciprocation, not just with Krishna, but with all of Krishna's associates in that spiritual world, on that spiritual platform. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this is the entire purpose of this ISKCON movement. Prabhupada said this ISKCON movement is a cultural movement for the re-spiritualization of the entire world society. Mm -hmm. Because Every single problem, every single material problem is ultimately only going to be solved with spiritual solutions. So it's not just a benefit on a spiritual level. Krishna consciousness is the root solution to all of society's problems, both material and spiritual. Now, what that also means is that as devotees, we should be expert enough to take full shelter of the teachings, to utilize the teachings fully. And when you utilize the teachings fully, you will see something amazing. You will see just how powerful Prabhupada's statements are, how much it works. And when you do something that works, and you perceive that it works, it gives you faith. Right? When you apply Krishna consciousness and you see it works, you think, my God, this is absolutely amazing. Huh? Huh? Shastri Kishrada, huh? faith in Shastra, it gives virya, drive, and smriti, remembrance. Huh? The Goswamis say this. That drive is this huge um, confidence and determination in devotional life. So as Maharaj was saying, if you want to be determined, you can have this determination by hearing and chanting. Prabhupada says specifically here, he says, let me read this point. <coughs> he says basically, I'll just paraphrase, that first there must be some faith, a shraddha. And he says, that faith is strengthened and increased by chanting. Hmm? Because our chanting is our association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna is pure. So when you associate with that which is pure, you also become pure. When you associate with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the source of all knowledge, that association is the most powerful way to, uh, to destroy what? What is the opposite of knowledge? Ignorance. So when you associate with the Supreme Source of all knowledge, that is the most powerful way to destroy completely ignorance. Hmm? completely destroying ignorance. In this purport, it speaks about the different stages. Huh? So, begin with, with Shraddha, from Shraddha, as one's faith increases, one comes to what stage? It is called? Sadhu Sangha. When your faith increases even more, you come to? Bhajana Kriya. When the faith increases even more, you come to? Anatta Nivati. When faith increases even more, you come to? Nishta. Faith increases even more, it comes to? Ruchi. Faith increases even more, you come to? Asakti. Faith increases more, you come to? And when your faith is complete, what is that called? Yeah. 
Yes. Wonderful. So as Maharaj just wonderfully pointed out, this point that I know no one but Krishna is my Lord, huh? and he shall remain so even if he makes me broken high by not appearing before me. Huh? He's completely free. Isn't that interesting? Prabhupada writes in one place, I think it's in Srimad Bhagavatam, that there is actually some type of practice whereby you can oblige Krishna to appear. Hmm? Well, actually he writes that. But we don't care for that. <laughs> His point is that we don't care for that. Our point is to serve. Right? It's not that we, that Lord, you have to do something for me, you have to appear before me. Our point is to actually serve. Hmm? Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur would say, don't try to see Krishna. Act in such a way that Krishna would like to actually see you. Hmm? Napariham. When Krishna is speaking to the gopis, he's actually explaining that their service is of such an exalted quality, there's nothing he can give them. Hmm? That means there's nothing higher than the principle of service. Hmm? And in the healthy state, there's nothing more relishable, nothing more natural, and not, nothing more nourishing to the soul, to the heart, nothing more fulfilling than, than wholeheartedly engaging in service. Hmm? Like this verse is speaking about everything related to Krishna. And Krishna himself says, Machita, Matgata, Pranabodayanta, Parasparam, Kathayantascha, Mamnityam, Tusyanticha, Ramanticha. He says, My devotees are experiencing great bliss and satisfaction from enlivening one another about him. Isn't that interesting? Enlivening. That means that the life, the life is from the glorification and the engaging in service, sincere service, pure service, unmixed service, anyabilasita, anyabilasita shunyam gana kamad yanavritam, that service which is done for Krishna's pleasure, free of any kind of tinge of karma or gyan. That is the life of the living entity. And it can all be achieved by this process of chanting and hearing about Krishna. Maj made a wonderful point yesterday. Even though we have also tattva and we need tattva, we don't, we don't reject tattva, we also want to hear about Krishna's pastimes. We want to hear about the Lord. Huh? How Krishna is so kind that he acts as a charioteer for his own devotee. The Supreme Personality God, Arjuna tells him, Krishna, go between the army so I can see who's on the opposing side. Right? And Krishna enthusiastically does it. Huh? So the Lord is Bhaktavatsal. He is a servant of his own devotees. And he displays this. He comes as Lord Chaitanya because he understands something that Prabhupada writes in Krishna book. Prabhupada writes in Krishna book that Krishna's devotees ex um, feel pleasure hundreds of thousands of millions of times more than the Lord himself. Isn't that interesting? The devotees enjoy more than Krishna enjoys. Right? For the devotee, Krishna is in the center. But for Krishna, Krishna is not, he does not see himself in the center. For Krishna, his devotees are in the center. Therefore, he comes as Lord Chaitanya. Huh? Radha Bhava Duty Suvalitam. He comes in the mood and in the lust of Shrimati Radharani. Because he understands that she is relishing more than I am. Hmm? There is a book called The, the Embankment of Separation by Gorgavinda Maharaj. He explains in that book that when, when Lord Nishingadev came, I think it was after he killed Iranya Kashipu, Prahlad Maharaj was sitting on his lap. And they were both experiencing Vatsalya Prema, right? Love of God in the parental ras. But Lord Nishingadev realized that of the two, between he and Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj was experiencing more ecstasy than he was. So every incarnation of God who came after Nishingadev always has parents. Hmm? So you can experience that relish and that relationship. 
Govinda Maharaj writes that. Hmm? So it's so interesting. This is the funny thing. We are trying to be the master. Krishna himself is coming as who? As a servant. So what does that tell us? Hmm? He's coming. He wants to relish what it means to serve Krishna. He wants to relish more by being the servant of Krishna than by taking the position of Krishna it's, um, himself. Hmm? As is pointed out, because he knows yeah, that everything related to Krishna is unlimitedly sweet. Try to understand this point. What we're dealing with, therefore, in Krishna consciousness is an ecstasy, a lifestyle, a fulfillment that is, that is outside of the realms of anything we can think of. It, we can't actually imagine it. But the keys are here as to how to experience the unimaginable. Hmm? And if we keep hearing this, and we keep remembering this, we will keep going. Yeah? These words of the Goswamis are the fuels for our inspiration and our aspiration to attain pure devotional service for Krishna, pure love for Krishna. The inspiration and the aspiration. Hmm? In the, I think it's Nectar of Devotion, it talks about shadow ecstasy. How sometimes in the presence of very exalted personalities, one can feel some of the flows of ecstasy spilling over from their own consciousness. Hmm? And even that is extremely powerful. If, try, just think about it. If, the, if there is such a thing as shadow ecstasy, where someone is experiencing some of the overflow of a devotee's own ecstasy, then what is, the, what is it that this pure devotee is experiencing? Hmm? We are Ananda, Maya, we are pleasure-seeking by nature. Yes, Ananda Maya Biasa. So if we, if we don't go deeper into our Krishna consciousness, if we don't endeavor <coughs> to become healthy, then we are allowing the disease to increase. So we have to consider what can I do to take more shelter of Krishna consciousness? Hmm? What can I do to go more deeply into this ocean of transcendental life? Huh? As next we will Marge will pick that up. Marge has realization on that. Yes, if destiny spills over. These are the things we need to ask ourselves. We should, we should think that I'm, although I'm qualified, I cannot live another day without coming closer to Krishna. Hmm? And we can pray like that. You know, dear Lord, dear Srila Prabhupada, what must I do to come closer to Krishna? What must I increase? What must I give up? to come closer to Krishna. Hmm? And as uh, I think Andrew would say, you know, when we chant, you know, we should cry. We should actually feel that sense. And he said, if you can't cry, you should cry that you can't cry. Hmm? It's interesting. I was discussing with one devotee in South Africa. He had a very nice realization. He said that when you chant with attention, Krishna notices he, he's present he says if you chant with feeling hmm, Krishna really notices huh? we have to understand and if we have this proper understanding then we will understand how difficult our situation is how unfortunate our situation is because we don't know how bad it is we we're not too bothered but if we really understood how dangerous and how unfortunate our situation is, tears would naturally come. We would cry. Hmm? Prabhupada, it's hard to conceive. You have a pure devotee who's always in touch with Krishna. Even if he looks at the most materially opulent and seemingly well-situated material person, it would bring tears. Because even the best situation 
is nothing compared to the natural state of the soul. Hmm? And so especially when Prabhupada would see old people playing golf, he was absolutely like, you know, taken aback that these people who should be preparing themselves to go back to an eternal life of ecstasy, and even the ecstasy in one sense is secondary, the main thing is the serving Krishna, right? People who should be going back to that, they're wasting their time hitting a small, a small sphere into a hole. Hmm? It's not good. So we are in a dangerous situation, a fallen situation. We do want to, pr want to practice Krishna consciousness with feeling. Not artificially, but if we read and study and we think about what's going on, then we'll think, oh my God, I'm in trouble. Hmm? And at the same time, if we're able to perform our devotional service with sincere feeling, hmm? with sincere feeling and with a real desire to know Krishna, to call Krishna, to understand Krishna, then it will be a very, very... It will be a heartfelt spiritual life. Hmm? There was one quote a friend sent me. I'll see if I can actually access it on my phone. Because I thought it was really interesting. And I wanted to share this with you. This is an interesting statement. And this is Shiva speaking to Sati. Okay? Related to the pastime about Sati's father, Daksha. Shiva says, Your father does have many remarkable qualities. But this is a problem for him, not a virtue. Learning, discipline, wealth, beauty, power and heritage. These six good qualities have negative effects when they appear in people whose hearts are not good. Right? In such people, these good qualities only increase pride. And pride makes one blind and forgetful of the greatness of others. So when we talk about this Cheto Dharpana Marjanam, even the qualities are, are, they are servants of the state of consciousness, of the state of heart. Huh? Bhava Grahi Janadana. Krishna accepts the essence of a devotee's service. So the activity of Krishna consciousness is a heartfelt, intimate activity. And you can meditate like that. Everything you can do, you can have that meditation. I want to do this nicely to please Guru, to please Srila Prabhupada, to please Krishna. We can hear about Krishna, read about Krishna and to become very familiar with this person. Hmm? What does Krishna, how does he like to dress? Who are his friends? Like Maharaj was speaking about the um, Priyanamasaka Gopas. Um, is that correct? Yes. The highest, yeah. I mean, it was so interesting, isn't it? That there is this entire spiritual world and an entire spiritual community of Krishna. They have their own relationships. Hmm? Krishna has his way of speaking to Mother Yashoda, his father. They relate in a certain way. He's a person. Huh? He's a distinct individual. He likes to dress a certain way. He likes to speak a certain way. He's got a sense of humor. Huh? Who is this supreme personality of Godhead? Huh? And in Krishna book, Prabhupada is explaining so much about Krishna as an intimate person, a person. And we want to know this person. Because as we understand more about Krishna and his loving exchanges with his devotees, you know what? It also removes our obstacles towards being caring and kind and supportive to one another as Vaishnavas. Yeah? Time? Okay. Okay, no problem. So, we'll stop there. Thank you very much, Maharaj. And we'll, and we'll take some questions as from the previous session and also from this session. And we should stop at one o'clock at what time? Uh, yeah. Is that okay? Well, yeah, the next class goes, is another hour and a half. Okay, no problem.
problem. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments, um, corrections, please? Hare Krishna. Okay. How can we find the right balance between chanting and service? I'm always glad that Chan and Moi Maharaj is here because Maharaj is much more realization. Maharaj, if you please. <laughs> okay, since he's given it back. How can we find the right balance between chanting and service? Okay, well, first of all, I'll beg that Maharaj correct me because whatever I say will know, will know would be as. Maharaj will have much more realization because whenever. I, I was saying Maharaj earlier. When he answers, it's so clear, you know, and much, it's very profound. Okay, but the little I can share. Okay, first and foremost, we should at least meet our prescribed number, like that, you know. <coughs> Prabhupada, in, one, in some places, he said that our only business is to sit down and chant all day, but we cannot do it. Therefore, I'm engaging you in so many other services, you know, like that, you know. Huh? That's the next verse as well, so we're preempting. But the point is that at least the prescribed, like that, if one has, um, you know, opportunity to chant more, the more you chant, the, the more you develop your namruchi, your, your taste for chanting. That's always good. And then also under guidance, we can see whatever else needs to be done in the association of devotees, and we can do that. It is actually, it is a dynamic thing, and it's also a personal thing. Because you have to know your particular situation. Does that make some sense? But the main thing is that what we would say is begin, ideally begin the day with the chanting. That sets you up for anything else. And then by that, anything else that's done, it will be done with better consciousness, better quality of consciousness. You know? But if you have, if you have facility, you can chant as much as, you know, chant your heart out. You know? Because that is, that is our... That is the means for self-realization in this age. Uh, and there is no other way. Therefore, all the other things that we do, they're also accompanied by the chanting, in terms of the you know, potent processes of devotional service, like that. Would you like to...? Uh, adding to that is my class. Okay, so Marge will go in. Marge will add to that in a, in a very wonderful and elaborate way when he speaks. Yeah, so next. Thank you. And yet, yes, oh, actually, was that, I think I saw Mataji earlier. Uh -huh. Good question. Um, so, is there more? Do you want to add something else? Is that? Oh, it's translated. Okay. Okay. So, there is a, there is a Vaishnava etiquette, and we do want to follow that etiquette properly. In another place in the nature of instruction, Prabhupada specifically talks about seniors and juniors in terms of Vaishnavas. He says the junior should be eager to hear from the more advanced. And Prabhupada says that the more advanced devotees should be merciful to the juniors. In, there is a misconception in modern society that it's better to be on the top or the senior person. Actually, one gains more by being in the receptive position. Mm -hmm. And therefore, whenever there is the presence of a senior, 
the, the first principle is that it, the, the mentality and the attitude should be that we want to hear from those more advanced than us. The, at, the, the attitude should never be that we want to, we don't even want to demonstrate our learning in the presence of our seniors. If a senior requests us to do something, then we do that in order to, as a service to our seniors. In a humble state, an understanding that it's actually their mercy for our own purification that this is happening. To try to demonstrate our learning before our seniors it demonstrates the wrong attitude, pride, and therefore these will be impediments to our devotional progress. Okay. So, okay. okay. It's okay, five to so. I think Sri Devi had a question. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that because ultimately we have to come to the realization of the body. But <clears> how can one overlook or uh, even try to ameliorate the situation where you have very, very uh, senior devotees who have been around for 25, 30 years mm -hmm. and their behavior leaves much to be desired? Mm. Okay. Okay, so. <laughs> So where you have people who are senior, but their behavior leaves much to be desired? Yeah, that's a good answer. Are you sure you don't want to? Okay. So, Ms. Marge wants me to answer it. Yes, there should, there should be a mood of humility. I'll give you one angle on this. And this is often something that we don't consider when we are in situations that we find a bit challenging. There's a statement by Prabhupada, which it has to be taken in proper context, and we have to still be wise and intelligent in our dealings with devotees. But at least on one occasion, Prabhupada spoke about not being upset with the instrument of one's karma. Prabhupada spoke about not blaming the instrument of one's karma. Every situation that we are dealing with has a certain context. Because our, mat our modern material society is so myopic or narrow-minded, everything is looked at just in the instant. But the devotee understands that there's a wider, there's a greater picture, there's a bigger picture. And also a devotee understands that Krishna is ultimately, if we're, if we're trying to follow him sincerely, whatever happens, we can learn and grow in some way, shape or form from that experience. So there's a story of a king who had an advisor. And one day the king was given a sword, a gift of a, very, of a very opulent sword made of very fine materials and you know, um, very valuable jewels. And one day the king was cleaning the sword. And while he was cleaning the sword, he cut his finger. Now, if you've ever cut your finger before, it's quite painful, isn't it? And then also messy. Right? So the king was in a lot of pain. And so he called for his advisor. So this king's advisor was known to be quite wise. So the king said to his advisor, I've cut my finger, what do you think of this? And the advisor said, my dear king, this is Krishna's mercy. <laughs> And the king became furious. And he said, you're saying this 
because it didn't happen to you. I'm in pain, I'm bleeding, and you, you impertinent, you foolish advisor, you're telling me it's Krishna's mercy. So the king called for his guards. He said, guards, throw this foolish advisor of mine in prison. So the guards grabbed the advisor and threw him in prison. So later that day, the king was going on his tour of the kingdom. And as part of his tour, he was going through the forest. Now there were some cannibals in the forest. When they saw the king, they thought, hmm, Prashadam. <laughs> so they captured the king and they, were, they gave the king to their priest who was preparing the king for a human sacrifice, to make the king a human sacrifice. Midway through the ritual, the priest said, stop the ceremony. And the priest said, let the king go. So the cannibals, they, they didn't understand why, and they demanded to know why they should release the king. And the priest said, we can't use him in this sacrifice because he's an imperfect specimen. He's incomplete. Part of his finger's missing. So they had to let the king go. And the king returned to his palace, realizing the wisdom of his advisor that this was Krishna's mercy on him. So he told the guards, please get the, my, bring my advisor out of the prison and bring him before me. So when the advisor came back, the king apologized and said, I'm very sorry. When I cut myself, you told me this was Krishna's mercy. I became angry. I threw you in prison. But I saw later on that you were correct. Had I not cut my finger, I would have been killed. I would have been sacrificed. And the king said, so therefore, I understand that culling my finger was Krishna's mercy. And the king said, but I do have one question, my dear advisor. He said, when I cut my finger and you said it was Krishna's mercy, I can see how it was Krishna's mercy upon me. But when you said it, I became angry with you and I had you thrown in prison. So I can understand how it was Krishna's mercy upon me, but what I can't understand is how it was Krishna's mercy on you. So the advisor said, my dear king, normally when you go on a tour of the kingdom, I normally come with you. <laughs> so what would have happened is, had you not had me take it, thrown in prison, they would have let you go and sacrifice me <laughs> instead. <laughs> So, actually, you cutting your finger was Krishna's mercy upon you. And you having me thrown in prison was Krishna's mercy upon me. So the point is that when we have different challenges or difficulties or we see things in life, we should look at it from the point of view of how we can learn from this, how we can grow from this experience. This International Society for Krishna Consciousness is perfect in the sense that it is a perfect facility for every sincere person to return back home back to Godhead. But perfect means that it won't necessarily do, um, be everything you expect it to be, but it will be perfectly whatever Krishna knows you need in order to progress if you take it in the correct way according to Guru Sadhu Shastra. Because there's absolutely no external situation that can stop you surrendering to Krishna if you so choose. Okay, so I think we'll have to stop there because we're slightly over. Shri Upade Shamrita Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shri Rupa Goswami Ki Jai, Jani Tai Gaur Pramanandi, Hari Hari Bo.